What have you learned from your, um, so after Facebook, you started social capital or what, what is now called social capital. What have you learned from all the successful investing you've done there? About well, investing or about life or, yeah. or about running a team? If I'm very loath to give advice because I think it, uh, so much of it is situational, but my observation is that starting a business is really hard, any kind of business. And most people don't know what they're doing. And as a result, we make enormous mistakes. But I would summarize this, and this may be a little heterodoxical. I think there are only three kinds of mistakes. Mm -hmm. Because if we go back to what we said before, in the business, it's just learning. You're exploring the dark space to get to the answer faster than other people. And those, the mistakes that you make are three, or the three kinds of decisions, let's say. You'll hire somebody and they're really, really, really average, but they're a really good person. Oh, yeah. You'll hire somebody and they really weren't candid with who they are and their real personality and their morality and their ethics only expose them over a long period of time. And then you hire somebody and, uh, they're not that good uh, morally, but they're highly performant. Mm -hmm. What do you do with those three things? And I think successful companies have figured out how to answer those three things because those are the things that, in my opinion, determine success and failure. So basically hiring, and you just identified three failure cases for hiring. But very different failure cases and very complicated ones, right? Like the highly performant person who's not that great as a human being, do you keep them around? Well, a lot of people would err towards keeping that person around. What is the right answer? I don't know. It's the context of the situation. Um, and the second one is also very tricky. What about if they really turned out that they were just not candid with who they are and it took you a long time to figure out who you were? These are all mistakes of the senior person that's running this organization. I think if you can learn to manage those situations well, those are the real edge cases where you can make mistakes that are fatal to a company. Yeah, That's I, what I've learned over 11 and a half years. <laughs> Honestly. Otherwise, the business of investing, I feel that it's like a, it's a secret. And if you are willing to just keep chipping away You'll peel back enough of these, you know, layers will come off and you'll see it. The scales will come off and you'll eventually see it. I really struggle with, maybe you can be my therapist for a little bit, with that first case, which you originally mentioned, because I love people. I see the good in people. I really struggle with just a mediocre performing person who's who's a good human being. That's a tough one. I'll that let you off the hook. Yeah. I think that those are incredibly important and useful people. I think that if a, a company is like a body, they are like cartilage. Can you replace cartilage? Yeah. But would you if you didn't have to? No. Okay, can I can I play devil's advocate? Yeah. So those folks because of their goodness make it okay to be mediocre. They they create a culture where, well, we what's important in life, which is something I agree in my personal life, is to be good to each other, to be friendly, to be good vibes, all that kind of stuff. You know, when I was at Google, just like the good atmosphere, everyone's playing and just it's fun, fun, right? Um, but to me, like when I when I put on my hat of like having a mission and a goal, what I love to see is the superstars that shine yeah. for some in some way, like do something incredible. And I want everyone to also admire that those superstars, and perhaps not just for the productivity sake or performing or successful company sake, but because that too is an incredible thing that humans are able to accomplish, which is shine. I hear you, but that's not a decision you make. Meaning. You get lucky when you have those people in your company. That's not the hard part for you. The hard part is figuring out what to do with one, two, and three. Yeah. Keep, demote, promote, fire. What do you do? And this is why it's all about those three buckets. I personally believe that folks in that bucket one 
as long as those folks aren't more than 50 to 60% of a company are good. And they can be managed as long as they are one to two degrees away from one of those people that you just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's easy then to drag the entire company down if they're too far away from the LeBron James because you don't know what LeBron James looks and feels and smells and mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So you need that tactile sense of what excellence looks like in front of you. Yep. A great example is if you like, if you just go on YouTube and you search these clips of how Kobe Bryant's teammates described not Kobe, but how their own behavior, not performance, because there was a bunch of average people that Kobe played with his whole career, but their behavior changed by being somewhat closer to him. And I think that's an important psychological thing to note for how you can do reasonably good team construction. If you're lucky enough to find those generational talents, you have to find a composition of a team that keeps them roughly close to enough of the org. That way that group of people can continue to add value, and then you'll have courage to fire these next two groups of people. And I think the answer is to fire those two groups of people. Because no matter how good you are, that stuff just injects poison into a, into a living organism, and that living organism will die when exposed to poison. It requires you to think <laughs> a lot, a lot outside of the box. It's lonely because you're taking risks. Also, your public personality, so you say stuff that if it's wrong, you get yelled at for- Constantly. For uh, for being, I mean, your mistakes aren't private. No, and uh, that's something that um, has been a really, really healthy moment of growth. It's like an athlete, you know, if you really wanna be a winner, you gotta hit the shot in front of the fans. And if you miss it, you have to be willing to take the responsibility of the fact that you bricked it. And over time, hopefully there's a body of work that says you've generally hit more than you've missed. But if you look at even the best shooters, what are they, 52%? So these are razor thin margins at the end of the day, which is really, so then what can you control? I can't control the defense. <laughs> I can't control what they throw at me. I can just control my preparation and whether I'm in the best position to launch a reasonable shot. You said that the world's first trillionaire will be somebody in climate change in the past. Yeah. Um, let's update that. What's uh, today, as we stand here today, what sector will the world's first trillionaire come from? Yeah, I think it's energy transition. So energy, so the things yeah. we've been talking about. Yeah. Really? And, and so isn't that, okay. Well, I think I think the way that I think about... So this is a single individual, so, sorry to interrupt. You see their ability to actually build a company that makes huge amount of money as opposed to this distributed idea that you've been talking to about. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you my philosophy on wealth. Mm -hmm. um, most of it is not you. Um, an enormous amount of it is the genetic distribution of being born in the right place and blah, 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 irrespective of the boundary conditions of how you were born or where you were raised, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, you and I ended up in the United States. It's a huge benefit to us. Second is the benefit of our age. It's much better and much more likely to be successful as a 46 year old in 2023 than a 26 year old in 2023. Because in my case, I have demographics working for me. For the 26 year old, he or she has demographics working slightly against them. Can you explain that a little bit? What are well, the demographics here? In the case of me, the distribution of population in America looks like a pyramid. And in that pyramid, I'm wedged in between these two massive population cohorts, the boomers and then these you know, Gen Z and millennials. Um, and that's a very advantageous position. It's not dissimilar to the position that Buffett was where he was you know, pack, si packaged in between boomers beneath him and the silent generation above him. And being in between two massive population cohorts turns out to be extremely advantageous because when the cohort above you transitions power and capital and all of this stuff, you're the next person that likely gets handed it. So we have a disproportionate likelihood to be, you know, we are lucky to be older than younger. Um, so that's, a, that's an advantage. And then the other advantage that has nothing to do with me is that I stumbled into technology, I got a degree in electrical engineering, and I ended up coming to Silicon Valley. And it turned out that in that moment, it was such a transformational wind of change 
that was at my back, right? So the wealth that one creates is a huge part of those variables. And then the last variable is your direct contributions in that moment. And the reason why that can create extreme wealth is because when those things come together at the right moment, it's like a chemical reaction. I mean, it's just crazy. So that was sort of part number one of what I wanted to say. The second thing is when you look then inside of these systems where you have all these tailwinds, right? So in tech, I think I benefit from these three big tailwinds. If you build a company or are part of a company or a part of a movement, your economic participation tends to be a direct byproduct of the actual value that that thing creates in the world. Mm -hmm. And the, th the thing that that creates in the world will be bigger if it is not just an economic system, but it's like a philosophical system. It changes the way that governance happens. It changes the way that people think about all kinds of other things about their lives. So there's a reason, I think, why database companies are worth X, social companies are worth Y, but the military industrial complex is worth you know as much. And I think there is a reason why that if you, for example, were to go off and build some newfangled source of energy that's clean and hyperabundant and safe, that what you're really going to displace or reshape is trillions and trillions of dollars of worldwide GDP. So the global GDP is, I call it 85 trillion, right? It's going at two to 3% a year. So in the next 10 years, we'll be dealing with a hundred trillion dollars of GDP, right? Somebody who develops clean energy in 2035 will probably shift 10% of that around, $10 trillion. A company can easily capture 30% of a market, $3 trillion. A human being can typically own a third of one of these companies, $1 trillion. So you can kind of get to this answer where it's like, it's going to happen in our lifetime. But you have to, I think, find these systems that are so gargantuan and they exist today. It's more bounded because price discovery takes longer. Mm -hmm. In an existing thing, it's more unbounded because you know what it is. You know the tentacles that energy reaches, right? Of that $80 trillion of worldwide GDP, I bet you if you added up all the energy companies, but then you added up all of manufacturing, you know, if you added up all of transport, you'd probably get to like 60 of the 80. Do you have an idea of which energy, uh, which alternate energy, sustainable energy is the most promising? Well, I think that we have to do a better job of exploring what I call the suburbs of the periodic table. So, you know, we're really good in Seattle, you know, the upper Northwest. Yes. You know, we're kind of good in Portland, mm -hmm. uh, but we're non-existent in San Diego and we have zero plan for North Carolina through Florida. Yeah. And so- So you, is that a, a fancy way of saying nuclear is uh, should be part of the discussion? I think nuclear, I think room temperature semiconductors. I'm I'm not convinced right now that the existing set of nuclear solutions will do a good job of scaling beyond bench scale. I think there is a lot of complicated technical problems that make it work at a bench scale level, even partially, but the energy equation is going to be very difficult to overcome in the absence of some leaps in material science. Have you seen any leaps? Is there promising stuff like you're you're seeing the cutting edge from a company perspective? Yeah. I would say not yet, I do, but the precursor, yes. I have been spending a fair amount of time, so talking about like a new framework that's in my mind, um, is around these room temp superconductors. Um, and so I've been kind of bumbling around in that forest for about a year. Um, I haven't really put together any meaningful perspectives, but again, talking about like trafficking in, in companies and investments that are very lonely, but they allow me to generate returns that are relatively unique and independent, that's an area where I don't see anybody else when I'm there. I'll give you another area. You know, we, um, I think, are about to unleash in a world of zero energy and, and zero compute costs 
computational biology will replace wet chemistry. And when you do that, you will be able to iterate on tools that will be able to solve a lot of human disease. I think like if you look at the head of like the top 400 most recurring rare diseases, I think like half the number, 200, is a specific point mutation as just a mismethylation between C and T. I mean, that's like, whoa, wait, you're telling me in mi billions of lines of code, I forgot a you know, semicolon right there. Mm -hmm. That's causing this whole thing to miscompile. Mm -hmm. So I just got to go in there and boop, and it's all done. That's a crazy idea. That was a C++. C, C yeah. throwback for people that don't know what I said. <laughs> There's two people who are clapping. Two people right there. there. Everybody yes, else like that. What? I mean, this, this is not a five. What are you talking makes about? Makes perfect sense. Uh, but but um. So that couldn't that be a truly a source of a yeah. if you the, the computational biology unlocks. I mean, obviously, medicine is begging for the the thing with energy like though this. is that the um, groundwork is well laid. Yeah. Um, and talking about sort of like the upper bound is well defined. The upper bound in medicine is not well defined because it is not the sum total of the market cap of the pharma industries. It is actually the sum total of the value of human life. And that's an extremely ethical and moral question. Isn't there a special interest that are resisting, uh, moving, making progress on the energy side? So how, like yeah. uh, governments and how do you break through that? I mean, you I have think, to acknowledge the reality of that, right? I think it's less governments. In fact, like I said, I think President Biden has done a really incredible job. Well, Chuck Schumer really has done a really incredible job because, so just to give you the math on this, right? Like back to this, so 3% of everything is of a market are zealots. But when you get past 5%, things tend to just go nuclear to 50, 60%. The way that they wrote this last bill, the cost, I'll just use the cars as an example. The cost of an average car is 22 and a half thousand. Mm -hmm. The cost of the cheapest battery car is 30,000. And lo and behold, there's a $7,500 credit. And it's like, to think the invisible hand didn't know that that math was right, I think is kind of a little bit malarkey. And so the battery EV car is gonna be the same price as the thing, and it's gonna go to 40, 50%. Um, so we're already at this tipping point, so we're kind of ready to go. Um, in these other markets, it's a little bit more complicated because there's a, a lot of infrastructure that needs to get built. So, you know, the the gene editing thing, as an example, you know, we have to build a tool chain that looks more like um, code that you can write to. Mm 